Hello again, everybody. I'm Dan Roberts, the publisher of The Vegas Voice, and I have the great pleasure of hosting the Hollywood Memory segment. And I get to do that with my favorite columnist, and that is <laughs> Beverly Washburn. Beverly, thank you so much for being here, at least for your own segment. And tell us a little bit about your very special guest today. I will do that, but first I want to thank you, Dan, and thanks to all of you out there for watching, and also for those of you who read my column, that means a lot to me. So yes, I'm very excited today uh, to do our little segment about my column, and I have with me my dearest friend that I've known for, see how long? Yeah. <laughs> We love each other like sisters. We've known each other for only 66 years, I Something believe. Something like that, yeah. yes. So it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you, Dan, and to all of you out there, my dearest friend, cry. Sharon Baird, who you will remember as one of the original Mouseketeers on the Mickey Mouse Club. Hi there. And, wait, and that makes me cry, too. When you <laughs> You know, one of the things that, again, I met you a couple of times, Sharon, and uh -huh. I've known you for like forever, is that you guys had careers when you were so young, and yet you were with the original Musketeers, right? Walt Disney, you had Old Yella, and I don't want to go into that much about Old Yella, we're going to save that, but I guess the first question I have is, how did you even get a start in show business back, all 20 years ago? Well, how, how <laughs> long that was? 20 years ago. Yeah. Oh, thanks. There you go. <laughs> Sherry, you start first. How did you get your start? Um, well, actually through my dancing. I started dancing when I was three years old up in Seattle. And um, my dancing teacher put me in a contest, uh, Little Miss USA, and uh, well, Little Miss Washington, and I won Little Miss Washington, went to California to do uh, Little Miss USA and came in second. And since I lived in Seattle, uh, it was always rainy up there. Um, my parents fell in love with the weather in California, so we moved there. And so my dancing teacher down in uh, LA sent me for an audition for uh, the Colgate Comedy Hour with Eddie Cantor. And I was too short for the part. So they <coughs> liked my dancing, so they put, wrote a special part in for me after that. And then Eddie Cantor called and uh, signed me under contract, uh, insured my legs for uh, $50,000 with Lloyd's of London. As a three, four-year-old child? No, I was seven. You were seven, then. okay, yes. go ahead. But don't forget, $50,000 back then was like a million dollars well, in today's yeah, world. Th th that's true. But it all actually started through my dancing with uh, dancing teachers uh, sending me out. And when you started that young, <laughs> How did you even know how to dance? I mean, how, did, did you learn how to do it? Was it natural to you? Um, my parents used to go square dancing uh, when I was three, and I wanted to go, and they'd say, you're too little to go. I said, well, little people can dance too. <laughs> so um, to shut me up, they took me to a dancing school in the neighborhood. And when I went, she said, well, we're doing a recital in six weeks, so you can sit and watch, and then in six weeks you can start Classes. So I was sitting there watching and tapping my foot. She said, you want to get up and try? I got up and did it and was in the recital six weeks later. So she said dancing was like a light switch turned on. Really? For me. And, mm -hmm. and again, we've discussed it was in the, in the magazine. Very quickly, how did you get your start? Because I'm still fascinated as to how it went about and what you guys were doing. Well, I actually started modeling children's clothes at the age of four, and my mother got me an agent, and I went on countless auditions. But I never got anything because I didn't have any experience. But we just persevered. In the meantime, my older sister, Audrey, was an acrobat, and she used to go to a, a lot of uh, veterans hospitals and places and would entertain them and I would sort of tag along and at one of the um, places where she was entertaining Jock Mahoney was there and people will remember him as Yancey Derringer and the Range Rider and I was about six at the time and I was mesmerized by this tall handsome cowboy and we met and then as fate would have it, a couple months later, I was on another audition at Columbia 
for a part in a movie called The Killer That Stalked New York with Evelyn Keyes, William Bishop, and Dorothy Malone. That's just a classic on its own, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's an oldie. Yeah. And um, as luck or whatever, it just was meant to be for me, and I'm so grateful. Jock Mahoney was under contract to Columbia at the time, and he just so happened to be walking through the lobby and had remembered me from um, meeting at this Long Beach hospital. And he asked my mother why I was there, and she told him that I was going to be reading for a part, which I had done numerous times, but I never got hired. So he said, I'll be right back. Well, we found out later that he went into the producer and said, oh, this kid's great. She's done this. She's done that. I hadn't done a thing. So as the story goes, he lied. They believed him, and they gave me the part. Just and, like that. Yeah, and so it was just a true blessing and the timing it was just perfect and so because of him they kind of took his word for it and I got that first part and it was a speaking role so once you have a speaking role and you have a credit to your name that's how I segued into other so things. So then really your whole career is based on a lie. <laughs> you know, <you're> <laughs> Pretty, much, Pretty much, yes. And, and then <laughs> Sharon you got your I, I guess would you call it a big break or a break when how did you get from dancing Miss whatever little title you are, to the Musketeers, to, to Walt Disney. How, how did that even occur? Well, I had done a couple of movies. Eddie Cantor, I was under contract to him. Uh, do you even know who Eddie yes, Cantor is? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, and most, most people will. Yes. But if you ask the younger generation, they don't even know who Walt Disney is, well, for God's sake, except for Disneyland. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is true. Uh, so, Eddie Cantor, had a heart attack, so his contracts were null and void. So I did uh, <coughs> a film, uh, uh, Bloodhounds on Broadway with Mitzi Gaynor. Um, I was doing um, Artists and Models with Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, and in the film we had to pre-record the songs at um, Capitol Records. So <coughs> we went there to uh, pre-record the song that Dean Martin and I were going to do, and Jimmy Dodd who was the leader of the Mickey Mouse Club and wrote most of the songs that we did. Um, he was there doing a recording session and saw me and recommended me to Disney. And my agent didn't want me to go out and do that because people were uh, requesting me rather than having to go out and audition. But um, they said that there was a six-week serial <coughs> called When I Grow Up and they s said, uh, We'll look at her for that. And so my agent said, okay, and sent me out. So when I get there, everybody there was blonde with long braids and freckles, which was not me. Yeah. And so they said to me, oh, go down the street to the rehearsal hall, and uh, there's an audition going on down there. So I went down there and uh, sang and danced for them, and um, I got the part. <laughs> so I just told my agent, I wanted to do it because I got to sing and dance every day. And, and yet, when you tell your agent, how old are you? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean well, you're, you're it was a kid. my parents that said to me, "Do okay. you want to do it or not? It's what do you want to do? It's up to you." Okay. Yeah, and I just loved to dance. The faster the music was, the more I'd laugh. I just loved it. And that, and then next thing you know, you're part of the Mickey Mouse Club. Yeah, but we didn't. I had no clue what it was even going to be. You know, nobody knew. We, and, and, go ahead. We opened Disneyland before our show aired. Right. We were already filming, so we didn't even know if it was going to be a hit or not. I mean, you had no idea we, what just type having, of classic it would be. No, just having fun, that's all. I didn't realize until many years later, uh, when I was um, in my late teens, we went to Australia for a tour because we were very popular in Australia. And when our plane <coughs> landed, we got off the plane, and you know the uh, stairs that you mm -hmm. board to go on a plane? And we went down those, we started out, and the crowds were held back by ropes, broke the rope, and were running towards us, and they said, get them on the stairs. So we went back on the stairs and put us on the plane, and we had to go through the crowds on that on those stairs, <laughs> yeah. and they picked us up individually and carried us and put us in the limos that were going to take us to the hotel. And the limo was rocking back and forth with 
heads all around us. And we, I was like flabbergasted. They said there were more people to meet us and greet us than there were when Frank Sinatra arrived. Oh my goodness. And, and yet, let me just switch over now to you. You get, tell us how you got cast in the movie Old Yellow. It was just a, another audition that my agent set me on. And of course, um, those of you who do read my column, I'm sure you know by now that I'm a huge animal lover. So I knew it was about a dog. And I, that was my main reason for wanting to get this part. So I read for the role, and I was just fortunate that they chose me. Why they chose me, I'll, I'll never know. But I know. It yeah. <laughs> Why? Yeah, well, you're probably the best actress oh, I've ever seen. Oh, stop it. Well, no, it's I, And I only paid her $20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, no, she, she's a bit biased, but thank you. Yeah. But um, anyway, so that was how Sharon and I met, because Tommy Kirk and Kevin Corker and the two boys in Old Yeller and me, we all had school in this big red trailer on the Disney lot, mm -hmm. and Sharon and the rest of the Mouseketeers were also having school. And so that's how we met, and mm -hmm. we just, I don't know, we just learned to be friends from the get-go, and, and um, we're still friends to this day. So she's mm -hmm. here visiting me now. We've been through marriages. Divorces. Divorces. Oh, and, and, and we're going to go all through that again if we, if we have the time. When you did, let's just talk quickly about school. Was it a real school? Did you have, what, what yes. I find very interesting about it is that you have all these stars, all these kids with all these little egos and stuff, and you're in school and a teacher might say no to you. Was that difficult or was it like, wait a minute, you can't talk to me like that? Well, <coughs> the uh, Board of Education, California, uh, <coughs> the teachers ha had to be um, certified. Cer certified to teach from first grade to 12th grade. And so, um, they were very, very ahead of our times. When I went back to school, um, I was way ahead of the uh, at school because we had our individual questions right. answered. Um, uh, what do I want to tell the, you? Would, would, was it something where if you sat in class, I mean, were you in the same class? By any? Well, uh, w the way it works is, um, it's strictly academic. There's no, uh, you know, there's not a home economics or sewing okay. or cooking or physical ed or anything. It was just strictly academics. And they were, as Sharon said, from the Los Angeles Board of Education, certified teachers. They were referred to as welfare workers. And the reason is because aside from teaching us, you know, schooling, they were there to look out for our welfare that we you know, we could only work so many hours a day. We had to have one hour for lunch. We had to, we could be taken away from class to go do a scene, but we had to have had at least 20 minute increments of schooling before they could take us back to the set. And so they were fairly strict with us. And they, um, we would, well, Sharon was there for, you know, the whole time for right. the Mickey Mouse Club. I was there for, three months for the filming of Old Yeller. So I would bring my studies from my grammar school and then uh, the teacher on the set, uh, on the trailer, it was actually a big red trailer, would teach us just like she would teach anybody else. But the Board of Education required us to go in every six months to have, right. to be uh, looked over by a doctor to make sure we weren't biting our nails, that we weren't nervous and uh, we were all healthy and happy. So they took really good care of us. They did. Yes. Right. You know, and both of you have something in common that not many people have is that you both met and spoke with Walt Disney, mm -hmm. right? For the clubs, yes. Yes. you for Old Yellow. Give us very quickly your impression of Walt Disney. Same thing with you. Go for a Sharon. Walt uh, Disney was. Oh, he, he was a genius. He, he called himself an Imagineer, and that's exactly what it was. I mean, he had uh, so many sayings that, that I just adore. But <clears throat> he knew everybody by their first name on the set. He would yeah, but you also had a shirt that had your name on oh, it, too. Wait, wait, no, wait. I, I, but I can even do that. I mean, at the <laughs> studio, there okay. were tons of people that worked at the studio, and he'd walk in there. Hi, so and so. Uh, <laughs> he wanted us to call him Uncle Walt which we couldn't do because back in those days, uh, 
we always respected our adults sure. and we'd call them Mr. Disney. And to this day, most of us call him Mr. Disney. Um, I, I just can't say enough about him. Even his um, cartoons, to me, I, the cartoons today are like rubber stamps yeah. compared to, but that's just me because that's what I was so, raised on. So you he would come in on the set and um, very quietly stand there and watch what was going on, but he wouldn't let anybody swear around us. Um, he'd have birthday cakes for us with Mickey on it on our birthdays. He was a, an Imagineer. And your impression of Walt Disney? Well, pretty much the same. Um, I had to read for the role of Lisbeth in Old Yeller, and he was there, of course. And of course I was excited and hoping that I would get the part, and it was a thrill to meet Walt Disney. But I think I was more excited about the possibility of working with the dog. With the dog. Yeah. <laughs> and that dog, by the way, um, was from an animal shelter. He was a rescue dog, mm -hmm. and his real name was Spike. And uh, he also uh, had a trainer, and I always like joke about his dressing room was bigger than mine. Yeah. But they, you know, they treated him so well that he was never abused or anything. He would have to have breaks as well. And people asked me if Tommy and Kevin and I were allowed to play with him, and we we weren't. I mean, we could of course pet him and all that, but it wasn't like we could play fetch with him or right. anything because he needed his breaks just like we did as minors so he would be brought back to his area with his treats and his water and so he could rest and we would basically go back to school because we had to complete three hours of schooling each day and we were only allowed to work eight hours a day plus we had to have an hour for lunch right. so um, we didn't get to know him in a way like you know, like we could play with him. But he was a wonderful dog. And like with Lassie and Rin Tin Tin, you know, collies, there many collies look alike and German Shepherds look alike. And so what they would do in Lassie and um, Rin Tin Tin is they would have several German Shepherds and several collies mm -hmm. and they would bring them in pertaining to whichever dog did best what they were looking for, maybe one could bark on cue and the other one would you know know how to fetch or sit up yeah. or roll over or whatever but with old yeller they only had one of him because he was rescued so i have a special walt disney story yeah please day disneyland opened <coughs> the musketeers did our little performance and then they marched us down the <coughs> parade and we went to the fire station and walt disney's apartment was going to eventually be up over the mm -hmm. fire station. So <clears throat> I went up the back stairs because we had nothing to do and <clears throat> it was all two by fours and barrels of nails and stuff like that. And <clears throat> I looked up there and there was Walt Disney and, and two men beside him looking out the window out to the front gate. And <clears throat> he had like a grin from ear to ear but choked up you could see that his eyes were and it uh, meant nothing to me at the yeah. time but now it means a whole bunch more yeah. one they final told him it would never work they told him it would never work yeah, yeah. <laughs> one final question for both of you okay because we are way above our time slot and we don't care okay. but <laughs> my question is with the Mickey Mouse Club when you reflect back are you surprised by it what a phenomenon it was in which Every baby boomer yes. in the world, if not the United States, yeah, I saw that. I saw you. Are you surprised by it? Same thing with you, Beverly, because there isn't a person my age, if not older, uh, and even younger to a certain degree, oh, I know old Yella. Yeah, you shot the dog. You know, <laughs> but th did you realize when you were doing this that it would be phenomenal after 50, 60 years? It still surprises me today. When people will say, "Yeah, okay," you look familiar, and I said, "Oh, did you work at such and such a place?" Or did you? no, it was the Mickey Mouse Club, and that surprises me. And, and same thing for you, Beverly. Again, I mean, I've known you a lot longer, obviously, but when you say I was in Old Yella, people stop and, <laughs> oh my God! I, 
I had no idea at the time that Old Yeller would live on the way it has. And uh, it's consistently, uh, from what I've been told, in the top 100 of the most rented uh, movies. And sadly, as most of you probably know, Tommy Kirk passed mm -hmm. away last year. And mm -hmm. he also lived here in Vegas. And he would come over and um, I'd make dinner because he, he was a bachelor and he loved home cooking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm devastated to this day yeah. of losing him. We were supposed to be doing an Old Yeller reunion this past January. And he would never fly. so we were going to drive in together because we've been friends, you know, th the same amount of right. time, s over 60 years. And sadly, he had a heart attack unexpectedly. Yeah. And, but he was so loved. I, I loved him. Yeah. We all loved him. And he had a huge fan base, just like the Mouseketeers. I mean, it's so iconic. And uh, it's just, I don't think any of us had any idea at the time that the Mickey Mouse Club and Old Yeller would still live on to this day. And it, it, will, it will continue to live on. Mm -hmm. I, Sharon, I want to thank you for being here. My what, pleasure. What I would like to do is, once the temperature gets below 115, <laughs> yes. have you back on again? Because I had like about 20 questions and I only did two. And that's as far as I got. So. Well, I hope I have 20 answers. Oh no, you have, <laughs> wait, you have all the answers, we know that. I thank you so much. Beverly, again, I thank you as always. Oh, no, thank you. And I want to thank you too, Sharon. She came here to visit, and then when you asked us to do this, we were very excited <laughs> and to share our stories, and we get in as much trouble as we can. Sure, and friendship. <laughs> there yeah, you go. Yeah. I thank you both. This is Dan Roberts for Hollywood Memory saying we will see you again soon. See you real soon. <laughs>